This is part one in our three-part series on ovulation, fertilization, and implantation. Puberty is really the starting point for ovulation in menses. At the onset of puberty, the body experiences the first menstruation event, which kicks off the menstrual cycle. These cycles, on average, last about 28 days and will occur every month between the ages of 12 and 51 or 52, barring oral contraceptive use, pregnancy, breastfeeding, and other events that block or inhibit ovulatory cycles. The menstrual cycle really centers around hormonal regulation. The hypothalamus signals to the pituitary via GnRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone, that it's time to release hormones, and the pituitary releases in turn LH and FSH, which are luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. LH, or luteinizing hormone, causes ovulation, and FSH signals to the ovary to begin producing estrogen, and it stimulates follicular growth. Let's go ahead and start at the top here. Like we just discussed, the anterior hypothalamus signals to the pituitary gland at the start of puberty to start producing gonadotropins, FSH, and LH. The job of FSH is to stimulate the growth, development, and maturation of ovarian follicles from primordial follicles into primary, into secondary, preantral, antral, and preovulatory follicles. LH, in turn, triggers ovulation and further promotes the development of follicles as well. FSH and LH also stimulate the production of other hormones. FSH stimulates estrogen production, and the LH surge, which triggers ovulation, signals to the corpus luteum to produce progesterone to sustain the endometrium in the secretory phase for the event of fertilization. These hormones, in turn, have a regulatory effect as well. Decreasing FSH and increasing LH is part of the role of estrogen, and this allows the body to maintain progesterone levels until day 28 of the menstrual cycle. If there's a viable pregnancy implanted, it begins producing beta-HCG, which signals to the corpus luteum to stick around and continue producing progesterone. So let's go ahead and look at this through the lens of hormonal control. The hormones that we've covered so far include FSH, LH, estrogen, and progesterone. FSH allows the maturation and development of follicles, whereas LH surges and triggers ovulation. During the follicular phase, estrogen increases and signals to the hypothalamus to secrete gonadotropin hormone LH, which then signals for the luteinizing of the follicle, or ovulation. Then progesterone slowly climbs as the corpus luteum secretes this hormone following ovulation. Let's go ahead and talk about the follicles themselves. A follicle has several different components. Starting from the outside and working our way in, the follicle sits within the ovarian stroma and is made up of fecal cells and granulosa cells. The fecal cells make up the outermost part of the follicle, while the granulosa cells make up the innermost part. Fecal cells are responsive to LH, and they stimulate the production of progesterone, which stabilizes the endometrium and induces endometrial secretions in the secretory phase. These cells end up providing structural and nutritive support to the oocyte and the granulosa cells. Granulosa cells are sensitive to FSH, and they support the growth and development of the housed oocyte. These cells produce estrogen and progesterone as well. Inside of the follicle, if it matures into an antral follicle, is follicular fluid and the oocyte surrounded by corona radiata and a layer of granulosa cells, as well as the zona pellucida and the cumulus oophorus. For ovulation to occur, you must have follicular competition, maturation, and expansion. There are several phases of follicular development, but it all begins with follicular competition. The cycle of follicular competition, maturation, and ovulation takes about 10 weeks. About 300 follicles are recruited for growth, but only about 30 are likely to compete for dominance, becoming gonadotropin dependent. Of these 30, only one will end up being ovulated per cycle. All follicles start off as primordial follicles, and almost all of them will mature into primary and secondary follicles. However, as the follicles enlarge, only the ones with increased expression of estrogen and FSH receptors will thrive. The others will regress. The granulosa cell layer dies off via apoptosis or programmed cell death, thus becoming an atritic fo follicle. There's a small scar on the surface of the ovary that really represents the failure of a follicle that has not achieved dominance and has regressed. You can see that here on a cross-section of a monkey ovary stained with hematoxylin and eosin. 
If the follicle does become dominant, it will compete to mature. The thecal and granulosa cell layers proliferate and expand as the follicle grows. An antrum will form and become filled with antral fluid, and one oocyte will achieve dominance and will have become a graphene follicle, where it re-enters meiosis and then arrests into metaphase 2 until or if fertilization occurs. The graphene follicle builds so much pressure inside of it that a stigma or an avascular spot appears on the surface of the ovary. The pressure literally cuts off circulation and kills off thecal cells, creating a hole where the cumulus oophorus, the follicular fluid, and the egg with the corona radiata exit from. Some women can actually feel the rupturing taking place. It's a small, sharp pain on one side of your body where the ovary has experienced ovulation. Clinically, this is correlated with a slight rise in body temperature associated with ovulation due to the presence of a necrotic site in the ovary. The body senses the necrotic site and mounts a small immune attack in order to protect us. This is an actual image of an egg being ovulated from an ovary. The fimbrae of the fallopian tube approximates the egg being released and picks it up for transport down the fallopian tube and into the uterus. The internal theca and granulosa cells in the ruptured follicle swell in response to an LH spike and accumulate lipids, thus turning yellow. This temporary endocrine gland called the corpus luteum produces progesterone until a viable pregnancy that can sustain itself via the production of human chorionic gonadotropin or beta HCG is present. For nine days, this structure will form, and if there's no fertilization event, LH and FSH drop, and the corpus luteum will regress into the corpus albicans. If there is a pregnancy, progesterone also drops and triggers the sloughing of the endometrial layer, which is progesterone dependent, and was ready to support a pregnancy that is not there. We can talk about several key issues that have to do with ovulation and ultimately cause anovulation. One of these being oocyte depletion, where there's less than a thousand eggs in a woman ready to be ovulated. This is a form of infertility caused by first the reduced number of available eggs and by the diminishment of the health of the eggs. This depletion can occur naturally with age. Of course, the more ovulatory cycles you undergo, the less eggs you have. This is also a form of unexplained infertility where there is ovarian follicle reserve depletion. This is associated with dysregulation of FSH and LH receptor density in antral follicles. We can also discuss an imbalance of gonadotropins FSH and LH, as well as different cancers that might affect hormonal regulation.